Hello there ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of Cookie Cast. Today on Cookie Cast, it's the football podcast. We're all here, we're all talking football. Plenty of games to get stuck into this week. There's like five games to talk about. There's also last week's games and uh, who won last week. I think we'll all find that interesting. And uh, yeah, football news. There's football news. Before we start, Please do consider like, share, subscribe, and comment. Leave reviews. The more stars and the bigger, better review, the better it is for the podcast. And ultimately, the better it is for you, because we get to bring you even better content. Right, let's get started. Here we go. This is Cookie Cast, the football podcast. Recording in progress. Well, if that's the case, I better open this pen and get prepared to start, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome along to another week, another fascinating week of football-based nonsense brought to you by myself and these three lovely gentlemen that join me here today on the CookieCast podcast network. Those three gentlemen are the leader, the man himself, Mr. Andrew Cook. How are you, sir? I'm well. I'm not well actually, I'm full of germs, but um, you know, well I'm 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 upright and standing. I'd I'd love to meet anyone who is a hundred percent tip top shape at this particular time of year. I I think everyone I've spoken to in the last six weeks has got a cold or some sort of flu or I don't know, some sort of like thing stuck in their ears or something like that. But, you know, it's just the time of year, isn't it? <laughs> Um, also joining us this evening is uh, our Nottingham Forest correspondent, Mr. Matthew Moore. How are you, sir? Marvellous. No, uh, no ailments to uh, to speak of. No, not an ailment at all. Just old, aching, just general ah, kind of old, very kind of old vibes. But very not, not, no colds or anything. Just the uh, just the old bones. It, 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 it gets us all. It gets us all. And to round out the. Uh, the quadruplet that is this particular podcast. It's our whole based person of interest, Mr. Stuart Woodman. See how are you, sir? Um, I, I, I appear to have something stuck in my ear. Podcast record. No, I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Woodman's his connection there. A little bit sketchy, as uh, he sounded a bit Dalek esque on uh, this side of things, sadly. Um, so, we open up this week with a little bit of news that came to us, not to date the podcast at all, but slightly earlier today, in that uh, ex-Middlesbrough manager Chris Wilder is no longer a pundit for uh, the BBC. Oh, God. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> He's back in football management, as uh, everyone will be shocked to hear that Watford, who never sat managers, decided that um, the... 16 or so games that he'd been in charge for was it enough to Slaven Village so they've got rid of him and immediately replaced him with Chris Wilder until the end of the season on a short term contract thankfully Middlesbrough have played Watford twice this twice already this season so they won't have to come up against him again uh, but apparently on I believe it's either April the 7th or the 8th Watford versus Huddersfield and as we know Huddersfield's new manager only in the job a couple of weeks well, Mr. Neil Warnock. Now, those two do not get on with each other. As when in, in any interviews, they refer to them as that other one. So Is that, that Sheffield United related, or I, I would imagine so, because obviously or the both the borough, United, the but... slight handedness of the borough, kind of. <laughs> they're both Sheffield boys, out So I, I, I imagine it's Sheffield United related, but it. it it, listen, it'll probably boil down to being something related to, in the past, Warnock probably called his mum a bitch or something like that. And, you know, I mean, can we just clarify that that, we, we, that is just there's nothing confirmed on the podcast? I think that might just be conjecture on my part, but I, I'm, just, I'm just reporting the facts. 
uh, as I uh, as I see them. And obviously, for those of you only listening to the podcast, the facts that I'm talking about are facts in inverted commas. Um, so, yeah, like I say, no Watford Middlesbrough games after the rest of the season. So, sadly, Mr. Wilder won't get uh, won't get to come up against his former club in his new guise. So, week 29 brought with it three games. The first of which took place on Friday evening, live on the telly box, where Hull City took on West Bromwich Albion. Now, um, I, I don't think any of us went into this uh, with any particular sort of um, optimism, apart from maybe... There's always one, one man, there's always one there's, man with optimism, there, I was going to say. Always, there is always one, and we'll come to that, come to that later on. But um, how did this one go down, Mr Woodmansey? Uh, well, Britain seems to be having a bit of a mare, so if you can hear me, but um, surprisingly, every finished up two nil winners. So it was a great start to the end. Far Friday night, um, we had Benjamin set his first goal for Hull on thirty three minutes uh, in thirty one. Christian Atsu, who passed away in the Turkey um, a few weeks ago. Uh, they knew he went down and had a little celebration in his honour. But Hull were, were battered for the opening 25 minutes. Rossini reshuffled. There was a bit of a an injury break. He called everybody over. Um, they had a little drink. He had a little chat. They changed the formation and then scored eight minutes after that so much much better I'm assuming that you know it was perfectly legit drink I didn't just have like some sort of Super Mario inspired super juice in there because uh, things things changed quite drastically um, then half time but they doubled the lead on 57 minutes officially it was an own goal from O'Shea uh, but it was a bit harsh not to be given as a Sean McLaughlin goal, but it did hit the West Brom captain on the way through. So, unfortunately, it was given as an own goal for that reason. But still, no count. I'll take it. And um, just a little side note as well, that uh, on loan, Newcastle keeper Cal Darlow was given player of the match, made a cracking start at home. And, uh, yeah, we've now got 10 points from the possible last 12 in the last four home games, so cannot cannot grumble at all. Very nice. Very, very nice indeed. So, from a predictions perspective, myself, Mr Moore, and Mr Woodmansey had gone for away wins. Stu, the least positive of the lot, had gone for a three-run West Bromwich Albion win, so gets himself absolutely no points whatsoever. Myself and Mr. Moore had at least given his team a goal as he was in the room, virtually. Uh, we went for a 2-1 West Brom win. Uh, Matt had gone for Slater to score the goal for Hull. I went for Tete. So I do bag myself a little bonus point there. Now, I know what you're thinking. Captain, uh, Captain Optimistic over there sat, you know, with his, with his fingers on the, uh, on, on the pulse swoops in, selects a 2-0 Hull City win on his prediction, bags himself two points straight off the bat. His two goal scorers were Estepinian and Tete, so bags himself a third point of the opening game. So, Matt and Stu still to score after one game. Myself, with just the solitary point, Mr Cook, take an early lead with three Tasty points. Our second game of the week saw my boys, Middlesbrough, taking on Reading, the place where I went to university. So always look at this as a bit of a bit of a Paul has extra interest in this game game. Um, potential potential banana skin, shall we say? Reading not in great form. Um, Andy Carroll in the in the week had said that he was you know feeling good and that he was really up for you know putting some hurt in on Middlesbrough with his number two shirt. 
and uh, he, um, he he played like a number two to be honest with you, as it was absolute dog shit. Um, but anyway, we'll get to we'll get to that. Um, so uh, Middlesbrough had a chance to open the score in the first half when they were uh, they were given a penalty for what uh, Paul Inter described as a very harsh decision against Andy Yadon. Uh, watching it back. I don't really think he could have had any complaints as, yes, the ball was struck at him from uh, quite close in, but if you actually watch the replays back, it almost appears as if he does move it out towards the ball. So, I don't think he can have any complaints there. <coughs> so, penalty to the Borough. Up steps. Mr. 19 league goals so far. Chuba Akpom just needs one to get himself tipped over to that tw- that magical, mythical... 20 goals in the league mark that no Middlesbrough striker had hit since good old Bernie Slaven in the 1988-89 season. He steps up, he dispatches the penalty with a plum, the monkey's off his back, he has got 20 goals for the season. Congratulations, Mr. Akpom. Lovely stuff. But we're about to go into half-time with a 1-0 lead when uh, ready to attack him. And the ball breaks... Um, I say breaks, the, the ball breaks between the uh, the edge of the box and the centre circle. Um, Aaron Ramsey gambles on the ball and manages to break uh, it's, uh, to say break break it away from the uh, the Reading player, but he just takes off. It doesn't break his, uh, his leg or anything. Uh, then pretty much runs the, the full length of the pitch, um, draws the keeper, slots it in lovely, makes it 2-0, nice and comfortable. But I were quite fortunate at that point, actually, to be going in 2-0 as um, just before... Uh, Aaron Ramsey scored that, that second goal. Uh, Redding did have a shout for a penalty. Which, watching it back, I think probably on another day, very well could have been given and uh, Tommy Smith could have found himself uh, in a bit of danger as he uh, kind of came came through the back of um, Shane Long. Uh, so probably got a little bit lucky with that one, um, but obviously the ref didn't give it. No VAR in the Championship, so it could only be over to him. Uh, into the second half, um, a delightful ball in from uh, Ryan Giles on the left-hand side, which he's, has become his calling card this season. Um, uh, just sort of stuck it right in that little corridor of uncertainty where the keeper doesn't know whether to stick or twist. Uh, and uh, Tube was on the end of it to stick in his second of the day and his 21st in the league of the season. Um, then similar again, uh, Aaron Ramsey, a ball in from the left-hand side from Ryan Giles. Uh, Aaron Ramsey on the end of it to stick it in for the fourth goal. And then, to round out the game, Marcus Force drives into the box, gets brought down. Penalty, two players on a hat-trick, but Mr Force picks up the ball, confident, sticks it on the spot, sticks it under the goalkeeper for 5-0, and Middlesbrough's heaviest home win in seven years. So, from a predictions perspective, who had what? We all had varying degrees of Middlesbrough home win, so we each got a point. Uh, myself and Mr Moore had gone 2-1. Uh, I had fours and Archer to score, so a bonus point there for a scorer. Uh, Matt had Akpom and McGree to score, so a bonus point there for Matt. Andy had 3-0. Uh, for the Borough, so he gets himself a point for the game for the score. Uh, he also had Fours, Archer and Akbom to score. Two bonus points right there. Mr Woodmansey, however, storms in with a 3-1. So, point for the uh, point for the result. Had Akbom to score two, two points, and also Fours to get a goal. So he gets himself four points from that one game. <laughs> so, what that does from a British perspective is after two games, we're all off the mark. Matt on two points, myself on three points, Stu on four points, Andy romping into the league with a whopping six points from the opening for two games. Our last game of the weekend took place on Sunday and saw Nottingham Forest take on Everton. Now, I missed the first half of this game as I was out doing chores. Terrible, terrible form. Uh, I did see the second half, but uh, how did the rest of the game go, Mr Moore? Oh, I, d- 
I didn't see. I I don't see anything because I'm stuck with gas telly. I don't, I don't pay for these fancy, uh, you know, premium channels, as it were. Uh, <laughs> um, I think from 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 the highlights that I've seen in the the commentary that I was listening to, it was it sounded like a good old fashioned game of English football <laughs> would be the kind of thing. You're like not not kind of your Premiership knocking about, kind of keep the ball, that kind of thing. It seemed like a good old like a proper like a good old six pointer kind of right at the end of the season. Kind of nobody wanted to lose. Um, but I think. From, from what I kind of listened to, Forrest didn't kind of start well, didn't really switch on. Everton started well, um, dominated possession, and then got a penalty. So a bit of a, a bit of soft one, really. Kind of, you know, it was a penalty, but it was a bit of a soft penalty kind of thing, right on the edge of the box. Shelby dangled his leg in, and you know, the moment you do that, the player's going to look for the contact to go down. Um, and Damari Gray scored the penalty quite nicely. Almost immediately, Forrest got back into it. Johnson, um, Pickford, tiny arms. Pickford could only uh, parry the ball uh, into his path, to which he tucked it away. So straight back into it. Um, I think Forrest kind of got into the match at that point. Um, only to... It, it's a shocking goal. I... I it's really one of them goals where you see it and you just think, well, that, that. You see the first header and you think, well, that was terrible that that first header went. And then you see the second header and you think, well, that's terrible that that second header went. And then you see the goal and you think, well, that's just all all levels of just terrible, like, noddy kind of football. Um, so Decore with a header uh, to give Everton the lead. Um that's how it stood at half time, two one to Everton. Uh, apparently Forrest came out in the second half a bit with a bit more about them. Looking at the highlights, it got a little bit kind of nasty, a bit tetchy, a bit kind of a uh, bit of argument argue, arguing going on. Um but I think I mean to just you know, just to calm things down, they brought Ryan Yates on. Um but I think at that point it seemed to really <laughs> drive the kind of drive the team forward. Um, and Johnson got the equaliser with a kind of nice bit of skill. I think Gibbs Why might have had a bit, a good bit of skill, and then Aurier, I think, on the on the wing. Um, and Johnson just kind of made himself a bit of space and tucked it into the far far corner, away from uh, away from Pickford, because you know, ball wasn't close enough. <laughs> he is. I mean, like, uh, yeah, we laugh about Ryan Yates being a shit house. Here, Jordan Pickford is the biggest shit house in the league. I have never seen someone whinge and moan and gripe <laughs> and get in people's faces for the tiniest of things. Like, I, honestly, it's just ridiculous. But yeah, so finish to all. I think it's one of them ones where everybody's a little bit disappointed. I think Forrest were disappointed just because they didn't start well, but finished the game really well and probably should have won. Everton are disappointed because they chucked away um, two, uh, like three point, well, two points uh, towards the end of the game. I think they've got the highest. I think they've lost fifteen points, like in the last ten, in, in like a total of fifteen points from winning positions in the last ten minutes of games. So they kind of got that's. I don't want to say it's relegation form, but that seems like relegation form to me, kind of thing. If you can't keep hold of keep hold of your leads and stuff like that, um, it, but yeah, to all kind of you know, after going behind twice, it's kind of reduced the damage of the of the thing. I think if if they would have won, it kind of brings everything even tighter than yeah, it already think, is. Yeah, I think one of what you like said there, obviously, like, the the more that teams find themselves in, in winning positions where they can't hang on and get the three points generally tend to be the teams that end up in danger at the year uh, come the end of the season. So obviously I'll have to watch a space um from an Everton perspective to see how they get on. But obviously they're they're full they're thoroughly in the uh, in the shout for relegation as it stands at the moment. Um I don't even know. I, 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 are they in the bottom three? I think they are the eighteenth as it stands, I think. Hey. I think they are on goal difference, I think. Yeah. I think it, last time. Level on points with Leeds, but Leeds have got a slightly better goal. 
Um, so, from a predictions perspective, both myself and Mr. Cook had optimistically gone for 2-0 home wins. Um, we also had both taken Johnson and Gibbs White to score the goals. So, no points for the score, bonus point for the scorer. Mr. Stu, uh, Mr. Stu, Mr. Stu and Mr. Matt had both taken 1-1 one, one draws. So, get themselves a point for the result. Sadly, they had Gibbs White to score for Forrest. Stu had Onana to score for Everton. Matt had McNeil to score for Everton. So, sadly, just the one point. So, the end of the week sees Matt with three points from three games. Very respectable. <coughs> Me, I had four points from three games. Uh, Stu had five points from three games, but taking the win once again, it's Mr. Cook, ladies and gentlemen, with seven points from the three games in question. Well done, sir. That is some stellar picking. Week 30 brings with it not three games for the first time in a couple of weeks, but five matchups. And we start those games in the Premier League, where Matt's favourite team, Tottenham Hotspur, take on his tolerated team, Nottingham Forest. His team will come to the black. So, I'll open the, uh, I'll open the predictions I've got written down in front of me. I have gone for a 3-1 Tottenham Hotspur win. I have gone for Kane to score twice, Son to get the other one, and Wood to score for Nottingham Forest. Although, why I've picked Wood, I have absolutely no idea. Because in that game against Everton on Sunday, he looked absolutely atrocious. Uh, Andy, what have you got for this one? Oh, no. Oh, no. He's got that, he's got that smug look on his face. I mean, Ray of sunshine look on his face. <laughs> Here he comes. It's, it's a 2-0 Nottingham Forest win. Of course it is. It's, it could be nothing else. Exactly. Uh, I feel I might be recycling my picks here, but I have gone with Johnson and Gibbs White to score. It sort of worked for him last week. Will it work again this week? Uh, connection permitting, Mr. Woodmansey. Spurs 2, Forest 1. Oh, boo. Goal scorers? Sorry, Matt. Um, I, straight out of everybody's most obvious top draw, Kane and Son for Spurs and Johnson for Forest. So he's gone for Son and John Son. Go on then, Matt. Tell us how bad the massacre is going to be. My prediction is virtually the same as yours. However, you forgot old boy rules. Oh, hang on. Old Surge. Of course. Surge he, is, or, he, he, he can be quite attacking, to be fair. So you've gone 3-1 as well. Yeah. Yeah. King 2, Son 1, Aurier, the score for Forest. Yeah, it's just... I mean, I think... It could be one of those ones. It depends on how Spurs do tomorrow. I think obviously they've got a Champions League game against AC Milan. If yeah. it's a rough and tumble, long match, then that'll play into Forest's hands a little bit because it's three o'clock on Saturday. Could set the tone. I think However, it's... if they lose, if the if Spurs lose tomorrow, then I think then they'll be out because then obviously they can't. Then they'll have to. Whatever the result is, if they get knocked out of the Champions League, then all eyes focus on the league to get back into the Champions League next year. So, yeah, if they, if, I think if they do or if they go through tomorrow, and it, but it's a prolonged game, perhaps extra time and stuff like that, then that plays into Forest's hands a little bit. But if they go out, then yeah, I mean three one might be might, might be generous kind of thing. I think it's just. I think the defence looks so shaky. Uh, you know, Warrell, 
That was awful. I don't, you know, you see Forest fans saying it a lot, and you, know, you don't want to turn on the guy, but he doesn't look good enough for the Premier League. There's like a not, there's not enough, there's not enough football brains to outdo his pace. And yeah. obviously Felipe is settling in, as it were, and he does some weird shit. <laughs> I think the problem for Warren is that. He's had enough. He's had enough games where he should be at a higher level than he is. If there's a yeah. good Premier League standard player in there, I I, he was playing well with Bolly um, before. Well, before he got he got injured, or did he get dropped? Either he got injured or dropped, and then Bolly obviously got injured in that like catastrophic minute at Fulham. Um, and then he's just not got... Obviously, there'll be a language barrier with Felipe. There'll be the fact that they've played five seconds with each other. With, you know, you know yeah, fair enough, training ground, stuff like that. But I think there's just an element of, you know, and the, that second goal for Everton was a prime example of, of kind of thing. And Spurs, Spurs score, they really score in the second half, but they score and they don't concede a massive amount of goals either, so... You know, and as we know, they've only scored three goals away all season. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, I think another thing that, that sort of can't really be overlooked for this as well is that this will probably be Conte's first or second game back on the touchline after he's had his um, yeah. like, health issues. And I think that, like, as stupid as it sounds, that could be massive for him because obviously, like, he'll sort of set the tone and stuff like that, and looking over and seeing your, your manager on the sidelines is obviously loads of oh, different... the toilet ball as well to wake him back, like, welcome him back. Exactly. You know, get your toilet paper ready. <laughs> the jokes write themselves. Our second game of the week sees Coventry City take on Hull City, and obviously this, for the Hull City fan, will bring back memories, as I'm sure he may even bring up, I believe Hull were the first team to beat Coventry at the brand new Rico Arena. It's his team he will come to him last. Um, I'll just dive in straight away again. I've gone for a 1-1 draw on this one. I've gone for Gukarec to score for Coventry and Tete to get his second in two games for Hull. Matt, what have you got for this one? I've gone for Coventry 2-1 win. You, you've said his name. Eucharist? Is that? Yeah. I with think a double. So. Yeah. And Tete to score for, for Hull as well. Tete. Mr Cook? 2-0 to Hull. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on a roll. My, my this is his favourite. In case you haven't worked out, it's his favourite scoreline. Nil you, two. You say that like I've picked it for four of the five games this week. Spoiler alert. On a different note, Estepinian and Tete to score goals, please. I mean, if Oscar doesn't score soon, he clearly isn't scoring for the rest of the season is it, at this point. Uh, go on then, Stu, you were shaking your head, so you obviously don't agree with any of our picks, apart from maybe Matt's. Uh, no, I was shaking my head because I did you take my statistic, but you also crapped all over my score as well. So I've also gone for a one-all. Um, I have also gone for Yoko Resch and uh, but I haven't gone Tete. I have gone Scrappy Ducky because he's, he's got to be due. Doherty? Yeah. I just think it didn't come through. I said scrappy wasn't being offensive. Oh, no, we got, we got the scrappy. We got the scrappy. That was fine. Our third game of the week sees Swansea City take on Middlesbrough. Obviously, this is my team, so I will give the last prediction. So we will go to Mr. Cook for this one. Is this one of his 4 0 twos? It is. Lovely stuff. Goal scorers? Uh, Tubes is addicted to goals now. He can't get enough goals. He's got to get more goals. So he's going to have another one in this game. Yeah. And uh, 
I keep saying his name because of the of, of the obvious connection, but um, Archer's going to have to score, otherwise he's going in the bin. So Harsh words indeed. Um, I need to look over the stats, but I think a large proportion of Tuba's goals have been scored at the Riverdance. So he's very much one for the home comforts. Uh, but if he scores away from home, happy day. Uh, Mr Moore, what have you got for this one? I have gone <clears throat> for a 2-1 Borough win. Goal scorers? I've got Akpom and Archer as well for the Borough. A yes. And Piro for Swansea. Interesting. Might not be the only time we hear his name tonight. Stu. Oh, no, go on, go on. Did I say that that stat that I'd sent through to you is broken Ravinelli's river, river side total for a season, is it? Or something like that? I think so. Again, it's something I need to look, at, look into because I saw something on Facebook where it basically brought down all the different Riverside Middlesbrough goal scores. And top was Vidupa. Second was own goals. <laughs> and then I think third. I think third was Ravanelli. So obviously like he he scored there was a season that the season that he was there, he scored thirty one in all competitions, but he only got sixteen in the league. And then he scored fifteen in the cups, which is absolutely ridiculous. But obviously they got to the final of both cups that, that season. So um yeah, I, I need to look into it, but I think he's potentially. It might be yeah. It might be that in a in a season, league league goals that we've signed in the season. Uh, Stu, what have you got for this one? I, I feel like I need to pull a piece of paper up to to the camera because just to show your workings and all that. But I've got one the nil Borough two Archer and Akpom. So you said the same as Andy's. And as well, Mr. Cook. I, if Archer does not score this week, he will bring in the bin. Yeah, yeah, definitely this week or, you know, in the next game or so. Listen, boys, don't quiver. It'll be fine. No? Not not having, not having that one? Uh, get to, get to <laughs> the point, Paul, come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, very sharp, very sharp, Mr. Uh, I have gone like Mr Moore, for a 2-1 Middlesbrough win. I too have gone for Piro to score for Swansea. However, I've gone for McGree and Ramsey to score for the Borough. McGree only seems to score away from home for some strange reason. Although he's got a couple of good hands, but most of his goals come away from home. Um, on the Middlesbrough team, <coughs> excuse me, we stay with Middlesbrough for their second game of the week, which takes Middlesbrough versus Stoke City. Obviously, Mr Moore has some sort of interest in this as he will be praying that Stoke get beat. Um, and well, well let's, let's, let's come to him. Let's, let's, let's see what his prediction is. Of course, I've predicted a Borough 2 1 win. Oh, what a lad. What an absolute lad. Goal scorers? Akpom and Ramsey. It certainly proved popular at the weekend. Uh, your Stoke goal scorer? Dwight Gale. He is somewhat in form, as uh, they pointed out uh, on Soccer Saturday, the fact that he doubled, if not trebled, his tally for the season at the weekend against Sunderland. And uh, not only did he do that, he did a Newcastle celebration after scoring, because he's uh, in... Full shit house mode. So big thumbs up. Is, he, is this the second season he's been at Stoke? No, I think he only just signed from at the start of this season. Uh, I mean, either way, it's been terrible. So I'll just. <laughs> it's not been great, uh, Mr. Cook. It's two nil for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your goal scorers. Uh, fours, lovely. And I feel you. I feel you missed a clear, obvious one. Uh, so let's put a bow on it and go with Archer again. Ah, 
Oh, and they hit it. Bullseye. 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 Uh, Ball Mr. something. <laughs> uh, uh, stick me down for a dead moon. Oh, yeah, two two. So come for and Apom for Borough. Missed the first goal scorer there. And Gail. Ah, uh, McGree. McGree and Apom. And then I heard yeah, Gale. that's the ones. And then Gail. Yeah, and you all know why I picked this one, but apparently somebody who gets called. Smallbone, Small so bone. he's definitely going on the sheet. Yeah, Matt's done it before. Matt's, Matt's picked old Smallbone for the predictions before, so people on the people listening to the podcast will definitely have heard that before. Um, I'm going to pick on for a standard 1-0 win with Akbom to score the goal, which takes us to our fifth and final game of the week, which sees Hull City go up <laughs> against League leaders and yet to lose in 2023, Burnley. Um, hopefully they can start losing sometime soon and then Middlesbrough might be able to win it. Um, uh, however, I do not think they will lose this game as I've gone for a 2-1 Burnley win on this one. I've gone for Esther Pignan to score for Hull, Teller and Cullen to score for Burnley. Uh, Matt, what have you got for this one? I've gone for, sorry, a 3-1 Burnley win. Ooh. Your whole goal score, please. Uh, Esther Pignan. And your potentially three Burnley scorers, please. Uh, Oberfemi, Teller, and is it Zoran? Oh, is like like Zahori or something like that. Z A R A R Y, I think. I'm just gonna look it up. Oh, I thought she was in the AEW, but apparently not. (laughs) (laughs) Ray. Nice. (laughs) Uh, Zaru Zaruri. And. The one, who, the one who sounds like his first name should be Anus. <laughs> I didn't see that one. <laughs> <laughs> that is right, though, isn't it? Uh, like, well, it's Anas. Anas Zaruri. Oh, yes, I can't. That, that's cracking that. I can't even read my own writing. Yes. Z A R O U R Y. Ah, good old Anus. Uh, Andy, what have you got for this one? Burnley might not uh, Are we just going uh, to dropped in that cracking? I mean, come well play, Mr. Moore. That was uh, subtle. <laughs> Burnley may not lose many games until they face Hull, where they will lose 1-0. Ah, not, not a 2. Not a 2 No, not a 2. I was like, eh, mm. And I'm just going <sighs> to blow the dust off Longman to score. Ooh. Ryan Longman um, recently uh, placed into a YouTuber's worst pre- uh, worst championship team of the season. I know it's. I was like, "Ooh, that's uh, that's that's unfortunate." <laughs> <coughs> to round out the week, it's his team. It's his game. It's his game. He may even be going to it. I don't. Know. Is he going to it? If he's not. No. He's going to tell us what score he thinks it's going to be. Uh, good home record that I mentioned earlier. Ten points from the last possible twelve comes to a screeching halt with a three-nil home defeat. Oh God! He's not again. He's not even giving himself a goal. Uh, goal scorers? No. Cullen, Barnes, and Teller. Cullen. On the um, Ryan Longman as well, by the way. It would be lovely if he could just finish a game at the moment, you know, like just get through 90 minutes because he's either a sub or get. He's not the player that he was at last season. He's not as it seems, but. 
fine. Uh, He's going to finish this really game with <laughs> Hopefully for you, Andy. Andy is convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that not only is he finishing the game, he's finishing the game strong with a strike deep into the hearts of Burnley souls. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, that's our five games done and dusted. Uh, do any of you gents have anything other to bring up for the year, uh, for the evening, for the year, uh, for the listening and viewing public? Andy looks quizzical. No, I was, I was, I, I was going to ask a question, but it's not about any of the teams and and. Well, you feel free. This is an open space, my friend. What do you wear? Like, ask, yeah, ask away. Uh, it, it, there was something about a, a a Premier League team. Um, going up against another Premier League team, and there being a couple of goals in that game. I see. I believe he's referring yeah, to the other couple, half of the Sunday after uh, after the Desmond that took place at the City Ground. There was somewhat of a massacre that occurred in um, in Merseyside. Uh, sadly, uh, as as funny as it is when Manchester United lose heavily, it's never fun when it's Liverpool that are the team dishing out that particular uh, thumping uh, as their fans as they uh, intend as they as they usually tend to do scurry from the woodwork like the parasites they are and um, give it give it large to uh, to, to the uh, the unsuspecting Manchester United fans shall we say uh, yeah a bit of a bit of capitulation by United really, because it's seven it was seven nil um, but t- to all intents and purposes it was seven nil in one half as they didn't concede until about the 43rd minute, and then the other six came in the second half. So I, they I, basically were good for the opening 40 minutes, and then absolutely shit the bed. I, I saw something, and I thought it was... Uh, and this isn't this weirdly isn't a joke, but I thought it was a joke. I thought it was some kind of wind-up. The, there was a point where they were reporting it was 5-0, and I was like, what? I, I don't understand. Is this some kind of wind-up? And then it ended 7-0, and was like, I mean, somebody surely getting uh, getting the marching orders after that. Yeah, you'd have thought so. But, I, saw, uh, I saw the guy's uh, plot today. It was their heaviest defeat since 1931. Yeah, a stat that uh, I don't know if other people have seen this, but it gets brought up. Um, Mo Salah, who scored two in the game, um, has more yellow cards for celebrating goals scored against Manchester United at Anfield than Manchester United have scored at Anfield in the time that he's been there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he's, been booked for, he's been booked for taking his shirt off while scoring against United twice. They have scored one goal there in the past five years, I believe. So, yeah, not the best. Uh, Another thing I did see, which does actually tie in sort of into a club that is sort of close to Andy's heart, is that this evening, um, Wrexham are taking on Dagenham and Redbridge. And the designated official for the game, before a change was made, was based in Dagenham. Ah. Interesting. Um, so a, uh, a Rex, I, I saw that a Wrexham uh, fan account on Twitter had uh, said that um, they've just announced the uh, officiating uh, team for the Notts County Wrexham game, and it's uh, Mr. Robin Hood from uh, Sherwood Forest who's been appointed for the game. <laughs> will he ha- will he have some happy friends with him? <laughs> well, quite possibly. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's all well and good. Uh, unless there's anything else, lads, we'll uh, we'll we'll end it there, and we'll uh, let these uh, let these lovely people get back to uh, their uh, their day jobs or their uh, evening jobs or their any time of day, whatever they have to do. Oh, my evening job. <laughs> <laughs> Let's right. about that, man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Um, thanks for joining me once again to take you through all this uh, all this week's football. Uh, join us again next week where we'll break it all down. And we'll do it all again for you. But until then, you stay classy. We'll see you next week. 
So there you go, what do you think of that? Couple of technical difficulties here and there, but nothing we can't overcome here at CookieCast. Big thank you for watching, big thank you for listening. Before you go, please do consider like, share, subscribe and comment. Drop reviews where you can drop reviews. I believe uh, iTunes and Spotify, certainly a couple of places you can leave a five-star review. Uh, you can also check out the website. It's thecookiecast.com. There we've got social media links and an email button. That way you can get in touch with us. That's it for this one. Until next time, I'm going to say bye, and I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to these grumpy old men talk about football. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe.